When it comes to Nicolas Cage in the role of a comic book character, we've seen an incredibly wide spectrum of performances, ranging from his elite turn as Big Daddy in Kick-Ass, or his stoic and hilarious outing as Spider-Man Noir in Into the Spider-Verse, to his iconic brush with DC when he was cast as Clark Kent in Tim Burton's would-be adaptation of Superman. And sitting in that small yet interesting catalog is 2007's Ghost Rider. <laughs> Ghost Rider is a Marvel Comics character who is arguably one of the most powerful characters in Marvel's vast gallery of heroes. The Ghost Rider, formerly known as Phantom Rider, made his first appearance in 1972 in the long-running comic book series of the same name. With powers like Hellfire, Demon Possession, and even the powers of the devil himself, Ghost Rider stood out as a hardcore anti-hero for the ages. The original run of comics followed Johnny Blaze, a motorcyclist who sells his soul to Mephisto to save his dying father and in exchange is bound to carry out tasks as the devil's personal hitman, a story that would stay surprisingly truthful throughout its live-action adaptation. And after Sam Raimi and his team revolutionized visual effects in Spider-Man in 2002, and then after the moderate success of the darker and more grounded The Punisher in 2005, studios were eager to get their darker Marvel properties into development and out in theaters. But is it ever really that simple? Just like most of Marvel's pre-MCU films, the Ghost Rider movie began its development journey as early as the 1990s and even had the Punisher director Jonathan Hensley attached to write and direct. Johnny Depp was even interested in playing Blaze, and I think we all wonder what that could have looked like. Nicolas Cage had been attached to the project as early as 2002, but he left the film after constant failed attempts to get a green light. But after years of development and rights to the characters being sold and shifted over the course of its production purgatory, Columbia finally hired Daredevil and Elektra writer and director Mark Steven Johnson to bring the fiery and heavy metal pages of the Ghost Rider comics to the big screen. And as always, the question today is, how does it hold up against today's world of comic book blockbuster spectacles? Let's find out in today's episode of Marvel Revisited. Ghost Rider sees Johnny Blaze, played here by Nicolas Cage, as a stuntman with a debt to the devil, as he moonlights as a supernatural bounty hunter for Satan himself, until he decides to use his powers for good and don the title of the spirit of vengeance, Ghost Rider. Sorry, all out of mercy. Alright folks, this is the third movie from Mark Steven Johnson that we reviewed on this show, including 2003's Daredevil and 2005's Elektra. Both of which are movies that I did not love, but there certainly were great aspects to the movies that have kept my hope for this director intact. Mark Steven Johnson definitely understands comic books, but something that I think stands out about his films is that he struggles to deliver on the adaptations of the stories despite his attempts to directly translate the page to the screen. While I can say that Johnson delivers mostly faithful adaptations, I must also say that sometimes it takes more than that to make a truly great superhero movie. Nicolas Cage stated that he felt from the beginning that the movie should have been rated R, and one of the very first notes I made when I was researching for this video was that same exact sentiment. This is most definitely a movie that would have benefited from really leaning into its darker tone and more adult themes. So let's hit play and see if this soul-burning anti-hero can hold up on the big screen. Let's ride. This movie opens up with the obligatory exposition dump to explain the context for the Ghost Rider curse and where it all started. And while I love that the first voice we hear is Sam Elliott's deep and gruff cowboy voice, I can't get over how unnecessary the exposition scene is. It absolutely could have been explained within the natural story. Okay, and also, am I the only one around here who just thinks of the big Lebowski every time I watch this opening scene? Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. So we meet a young Johnny Blaze who works in a traveling carnival with his father. The pair are famous for their epic motorcycle stunts and ability to take it to the next level. Johnny wants more out of life and he plans to run away with his girlfriend Roxy when he finds out that his father is dying of cancer. 
and Johnny feels pretty sad about it for a second, but then the devil, or Mephistopheles as he's known in this movie, played by Peter Fonda, shows up and offers to cure Johnny's dad of his cancer in exchange for Johnny's soul. Johnny doesn't ask a lot of questions and sort of accidentally agrees to the deal immediately. And I figure now is a good time to mention that the cinematography of this movie is actually pretty good. The film grain and rich colors really make it feel like a comic book, but the movie never looks cheap and I can appreciate that after seeing so many of these movies that don't prioritize their visual storytelling. The next day, his father is cancer free, as promised, but then he immediately dies doing a stunt, which we learn is later the work of Mephisto. Very much a needful thing situation. Johnny attempts to run, but Mephisto explains that Johnny's contract will need to be fulfilled eventually and he will find him when he needs him. I have to say, kudos to the casting department too on this movie. The younger version of Nicolas Cage and Eva Mendez characters are really good. I never really noticed it before, but there are definitely times where both of these actors look exactly like their older counterparts and vice versa, so well done. Fast forward years later and Johnny is all grown up and headlining shows where he performs outrageous motorcycle stunts for sold out stadiums as some sort of extreme stunt celebrity. Nicky Cage has some very strange eccentricities as Johnny Blaze that I'm not really sure that I understand. Like he only eats red and yellow jelly beans and for some reason he sips them out of a martini glass. But why? You're a slow learner, aren't you, writer? He also likes to listen to loud music while watching TV, and I get that maybe Cage is trying to play with the trauma of how his character lost his father, but these are some very strange habits for someone coping with grief. What's going on with the monkey TV shows and this obsession with candy? Did, did, did I miss something? Why do you want to listen to the TV with the stereo on? Because I like to party. Well, after being acquainted with Johnny and his crew in present day, we now get to meet our main antagonist for this movie, Blackheart played by professional weird dude, Wes Bentley. He's the son of Mephisto who is attempting to get his hands on a Ghost Rider contract that would give him the power of a thousand evil souls. And he wants to use them to become more powerful than his father. And honestly, I know Blackheart is from the comics, but the way he was done in this movie was just so hard to watch. Which reminds me, this movie also suffers from very poor dialogue, and I think that's a trend in all of Mark Steven Johnson's scripts, but this movie is maybe the worst offender. Even with quality actors like Bentley, Cage, and Mendez, these lines are just written to sound awful, and no amount of good acting can really fix that. You're going down. I don't think so. So Johnny reunites with Roxy after years of not speaking, and Johnny gets her out on a date with him by pulling a crazy stunt on the highway that is honestly kind of fun to watch. And this is where Cage really gives Johnny some kind of human personality for the audience to connect with. Roxy accepts the date, but gets stood up because after what feels like forever, we finally get to see some form of Ghost Rider action. And it's pretty f***ing cool. The pacing of this movie also suffers a bit from the slow build and the very rushed final act. It takes about an hour of sitting through this movie before we see any sign of Johnny's powers. And then after seeing his first night out as a somewhat confused vigilante learning about his curse, we return back for more exposition from Sam Elliott's character, the caretaker. God knows I've made my share of mistakes. He's like the OG Ghost Rider, although we haven't learned that in the movie yet, and he sort of serves as the Alfred to Batman or Whistler to Blade. Caretaker provides some explanation of the rules of this curse and sort of prepares Johnny for the next time it happens. We also see some small origins for classic Ghost Rider weapons that any fans of the comics would recognize. And when I said that Mark Steven Johnson usually fails at translating comics to live action, this is kind of what I'm talking about. In today's high budget, digital effects, IP riddled movies, it seems like there needs to be an elaborate origin for every little detail or accessory that makes it into the movie, and I find that to be incredibly annoying. However, this movie shows us how Blaze gets his chain and his studded jacket. And I personally think it makes sense to show how he gets the chain, but the studded jacket scene was just ridiculous. 
In fact, this movie dedicated an entire story beat to him getting the studded jacket, and it basically looks the exact same as the one he was already wearing. Nice jacket. <laughs> the entire middle act of this movie is basically Johnny preparing to take on Blackheart, but because the first hour and 20 minutes were spent building up the Ghost Rider reveal and then giving us a few scenes of him learning his power, we end up left with a lot of talking about the Ghost Rider curse and not a lot of seeing it. But we do get a random role from a 2007 Rebel Wilson who plays a victim of a mugging, so that's pretty sweet. Let's talk about the special effects. They really start to kick in in the movie after Johnny becomes Ghost Rider, and to my surprise, this is probably one of the better looking superhero films of the mid 2000s. The CGI for Ghost Rider's look and the hellfire on display actually looks cool. The film is vibrant and the colors are very saturated, so the bright orange fire against the harsh blue moonlight of the nightscape really sells the effects in a way that makes the movie's action pretty exciting. There's a lot of cool comic booky shots in this movie too that frame Ghost Rider to look like a total badass, and the use of his powers is not without its merits as well. Your soul is stained by the blood of the innocent. Feel their pain. But I really don't connect with any of the villains in this movie. Blackheart is just ridiculous and looks like a CW villain. And the demons he gathers to help him hunt are completely forgettable. As in, I almost forgot to mention them at all. They look pretty cool and some of them have visually impressive moments, but we don't see much of them and they don't seem to be even close to worthy foils for Ghost Rider. And beyond the boring middle act of this film, we get a disappointing rush job of a final conflict. But just before Johnny goes toe to toe with Blackheart, we do get one of my favorite scenes in this movie, the caretaker reveal. I got one last ride left in me. I love the old western version of Ghost Rider coming in to give a final push to Johnny before the rumble, but it also left me very confused. Like he turns into cowboy Ghost Rider and the two ride on their hell vehicles through the Texas landscape while the music swells and we see our heroes in full glory, but then Caretaker just like turns around and goes home. This is the end of the trail for me, I got nothing left. Johnny faces off with Blackheart and tries all of his new tricks to subdue him, but fails to prevent him from getting the contract and the thousand souls. Luckily, Johnny uses that as the final ace up his sleeve. See, because Blackheart now has a thousand souls, Johnny can use his power to destroy souls by forcing Blackheart to endure all the pain that the souls victims felt. And trust me, it sounds cooler than it looks because they basically use the exact same footage that they used for the first time we see Johnny do this in the movie. Annoying. You're pissing me off. Okay, okay, uh, sorry. Johnny effectively breaks the curse by beating Blackheart and Mephisto shows up out of nowhere to grant Johnny his freedom. But the twist is Johnny declines his freedom and instead uses some of that cringe Mark Steven Johnson dialogue to basically tell Mephisto to f off and that he's keeping his powers and using them for good. Back to Truthfully, I did not hate revisiting this movie. In fact, there are a few elements that really work for me, and I think it shows Mark Steven Johnson's growth as a filmmaker. Visually, the movie looks pretty damn good, and the shots and composition used for it were solid throughout the entire film. As well, Nicolas Cage, while now being seen as a pop culture icon, brings some level of maturity and weight to this performance that nobody else could have done. He plays a weird, tortured, but totally badass Texas stuntman from the circus, and for my money, I wouldn't want anybody but Nicolas Cage for that. Thank you. And of course, it must be said that the accuracy of the movie's portrayal of the source material is pretty spot on. Almost everything that you would want to see from the original run of Ghost Rider's origin was basically covered in the movie. It may have not been paced well, but it was definitely faithful. It also must be said that the movie's utilization of modern rock tracks and some classic jams helps elevate the movie into feeling like a true representation of what was cool in 2007. And I ain't mad about it. <laughs> 
The film was considered a success as it pulled in twice its budget with a box office take of $228 million. It did get some people into seats when it released, but the reviews for the movie unfortunately were not as nice as mine has been. And sure, most of the characters are bland and the writing isn't very good and maybe the story is a little too simple to justify a two hour runtime. But if you ask me, there is more fun to be had with this movie than the likes of any of this director's previous Marvel films. The movie holds a less than stellar 27% on Rotten Tomatoes, and most critics have either forgotten it or wish they had. But to me, and apparently the folks at Columbia Pictures, the movie deserved one more outing to prove itself as a true standout in early Marvel movie media. And that movie would be Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance in the year 2011. We will definitely be taking a look at that one one of these days. But for now, do leave a comment down below and let me know your thoughts on 2007's Ghost Rider. Or let us know who you would like to see play Ghost Rider in the MCU when the time comes for an inevitable reboot. Can you keep up? But as always, thanks for watching and we will see you next time on Marvel Revisited.